well there thank you Tony good morning sisters and brothers uh, and let me join with the chair and welcome you all to Brighton to your industrial sector conferences these conferences are as the chair has said a cornerstone of our union and our democracy indeed they are where the most important aspects of Unite's life and work are debated because make no mistake, getting our industrial business right is always, always our top priority. If what we do in the workplace and at the bargaining table is not done right, then nothing else works. There is so much to be proud of in Unite today, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but this is our foundation. Preserving and improving living standards, winning job security, standing up against injustice and inequality at work. What that means in your particular industry is a matter for each of your conferences today and you will have your debates on how to win, how best to win for work is where you are. I want to take this opportunity to set the scene in terms of what UNITE is doing overall. To send you into your particular conferences with a sense of the bigger picture. In one area after another, UNITE is now leading the labour movement across Britain and Ireland. Politically, our role is central, both through the Labour Party and directly with government. The strongest voice for work is rights. The part we've played in bringing a radical progressive Labour Party to the threshold of power when most others doubted that this was possible is a tribute to our political strategy and to the strength and purpose of your Executive Council. Our influence is acknowledged by all and feared by our enemies in government and the media. And let no one say that our political work has nothing to do with our industrial mission. Just count how many resolutions you'll debate in your conferences which call for legislation or demand that the government do something or stop doing something else. All of that is politics. And advancing our demands depends very often on having a parliamentary majority and ministers sympathetic to our cause. It does not mean ignoring the present government. I and senior colleagues uh, can always deal with dialogue with Tory ministers where members needs demand it. I've developed, for example, a working relationship with the Secretary of State for Business, Greg Clark. And these type of approaches are important. We will never let partisan politics get in the way of fighting for jobs and investment. But let me say today, Unite is going to be fighting all out for an early general election and a Labour victory that can really transform our prospects as a country in manufacturing, in public services, in transport, in construction, finance and energy alike. Unite is also leading in the legal arena. As never before, our legal work is integrated with our industrial activity to win for our members. Our legal department has continued to lead the way in defending and establishing rights for workers. We built on our holiday pay success, winning vital litigation to establish that it should not only be compulsory overtime in pay packets, but voluntary overtime as well. We twice successfully defeated Argus's High Court challenge to our industrial ballot to start the fight against the fight back against the restrictions of the Trade Union Act. We are the only union to continue to fight for victims of blacklisting. Over 70 new cases being taken, not just against the companies, but against the individual decision makers in those companies. 
in landmark litigation we've established a law that companies who offer pay rises to those who leave a union is unlawful. In the British Airways mixed fleet dispute, we successfully challenged attempts to financially punish those members who took strike action. And we have represented literally thousands of members, recovering over £150 million in compensation for our members. Our legal strategy is now an integral part of our industrial strategy and seen as part of our weaponry in our continued fight on behalf of our members. Unite's Leverage continues to lead the way. Unite is the first trade union in Britain and Ireland to develop serious alternative strategies to crisis campaigns. Showing how to win when conventional industrial action is either not possible or not appropriate. And our leverage campaigns have had a 100% success. We have put the employers on the back foot. The CBI have engaged notorious law firm Eversheds to investigate, investigate our tactics, but that is because the Tories themselves failed to outlaw leverage as they'd all wished for through the fiasco of the car review. You might remember that. Of course, leverage is not the way forward for every industrial crisis. And I'm the last General Secretary to ever say that strikes are a thing of the past. Mobilising our members against injustice and employers' actions is always our first priority. But with our leverage work, we have given each and every one of you a new option for when the chips are down. Unite is growing stronger through mergers too. This year, we created for the first time a single union for all intent and purpose in the construction industry. When UCAT, with its proud history, transferred into UNITE. There's only time, colleagues, to make the briefest reference to some of our other achievements. Putting Mike Ashley at Sports Direct on the back foot, a battle we mean to win. Our successful Fair Tips campaign in restaurants and bars. Our fast-growing community membership initiative. Our role sustaining the increasingly high-profile left think tank class. Our schools programme explaining trade unions to 15 and 16 year olds. And so much more. So I'm not exaggerating or boasting if I say that in Unite we have all of us built a remarkable democratic working class organisation. But, and there's always a book colleagues, it would be a bit unreal for me to speak to you today, leading lay activists from across our countries. And not acknowledge the damage that was done to the union's public standing by the general secretary election earlier this year. You'll appreciate that as much that I cannot say about that episode at the present, but I will in time. And I also appreciate that those of you here will have voted in good faith and as is your absolute right for any one of the three candidates who stood in that election, including myself. But all of us should be alarmed when the work of our union is traduced, when we are painted as a reactionary or useless organisation, and when the tawdry techniques of tabloid journalism are imported into our democracy. And all of us suffer when our essential unity of purpose, despite legitimate differences, is pushed to breaking point by tactics of fear and smear. The Unite that was portrayed in the press during that campaign was not the Unite that we all know and work for. And it will be up to your executive to find ways consistent with our rules and the obligations of democracy and free speech to ensure that in the future our elections are a credit to the union 
are not used as a political football by those who seek to use and abuse us for their own agenda. That is one of the key ways, I believe, to ensure a higher degree of involvement by members in our democracy, by treating each other with respect and decency and never letting ambition prevail over the common interest. Colleagues, as I said, we are above all an industrial organisation. The media coverage misleads intentionally so, of course, by presenting us all about Westminster. You know 95% of what we do is industry, work related, and most of it is done by you, our lay representatives. We never for a day go by lose that focus at the sharp end. That's why at the last sector conferences we launched Work, Voice and Pay as our union's broad industrial strategy. We've taken great steps forward towards turning that plan into real gains, including collecting industrial data on pay and negotiations on a huge scale. A first for a major trade union in the whole of Europe. 28,000 recognised workplaces. 15,000 of our shop stewards and activists have already visited our Work, Voice and Pay website. And now we're going to take it much further. We will deliver direct access to financial information on your employers and enable our shop stewards and officers to produce professional pay claims in a matter of minutes. Of course, we're not developing our strategy in a vacuum. We do so in an economic situation of great turbulence, confronting new challenges alongside some very familiar problems. Under the heading of familiar, alas, is the relentless pressure on our members' jobs. You know this better than me. One sector after another, the threat of savage job cuts is a reality we're having to deal with. In the public services, of course, this is directly driven by the government, with its endless cuts affecting local authorities, the NHS and other vital provisions. If Jeremy Corbyn's Labour has achieved nothing else, serving notice on austerity would be achievement enough for working people. There is little sign, unfortunately, that the government has got the message. Just one more reason why we need to call time on the Tories. But of course, the job crisis spreads far wider. The steel industry, car plants like the Vauxhall factory sold to PSA, Bombardier and BAE Systems in Aerospace, Monarch Airlines and across the financial services industry. In all these areas, your union is having to put the fight for jobs first, sometimes with some success in what is, after all, the most difficult struggle we have had to address. Nothing unusual about these challenges, but colleagues, there is something different about this jobs call. It comes at the same time as the longest effective pace freeze in many places an actual real pay decline in the history of economic data. You know, for generations we've been told by the bosses, the Tories and the media that the job losses were caused by greedy workers asking for too much pay. We were also supposedly pricing ourselves out of jobs. So I ask, would the elite now care to explain why skilled workers, many of whom have never been on strike, have had to endure years of stagnant or falling wages and yet still face the sack? The short answer, of course, is corporate greed seeking still greater profits elsewhere in the world. So now we have the shameful situation where Britain is the only country in the developed world where the country as a whole is getting richer 
while workers are getting poorer. This is the result of 35 years of consecutive governments, including Labour, happy to see unions and workers get weaker and employers ever stronger. That's a political point as well, of course. But we cannot wait for an election to address this. That's why we started Workvoice Pay, to secure for our members real improvements in the here and now. Colleagues, the problems we face in protecting jobs risks paling into insignificance against those we face arising from Brexit. Unite's position was clear. We supported Remain in the referendum, not because we're starry-eyed about the EU or its workings, but because we believe that access to the single market is so vital for so many jobs. Moreover, we acknowledge that some of the workers and social rights we depend upon come from EU legislation and agreements. Along with most of the Labour movement, we lost that particular argument. And we accept the democratic result, but every anxiety we had has been increased by the Tory conduct of Brexit negotiations since. Without going into too much detail, it's now clear that due to the government's divisions and bungling and under pressure from its extreme right-wing elements, there is a serious danger of Britain crashing out of the EU without any sort of continuing trade agreement. The CBI is warning that if there is no agreement by March of next year, the economy will be in trouble. And this raises the real danger of a jobs massacre for our members and for many more. That's why we support Labour's constructive approach, which includes staying within the single market and customs union, or certainly having access to it for four years, allowing time for mature negotiations to yield an agreement which can give British-based industries the maximum possible tariff-free access to the single market. But we're doing more. We've also worked to address one of the concerns which influenced the referendum among our members and working people more generally. The impact that the so-called free movement of labour has had on wage rates and conditions in certain sectors. And let me say this first, that it is not the fault of any worker who has come here to seek a better life for themselves and their families. It is the responsibility exclusively of the unscrupulous employer looking to cheapen the value of labour power here in Britain. The greedy bosses who will always seek to squeeze workers to get their grubby hands on an extra book. Unite will always be in the forefront of the fight against racism as against all forms of injustice and inequality. But we know we have to do more. That is why we've called for labour market regulation and control to address the forcing down of wages through the use of migrant labour. We have said, and labour has supported this, that employers should only recruit labour abroad if they are covered by a trade union recognition or a collective bargaining agreement for their company or sector. That way this problem can start to evaporate as it has done in these situations in the past. The abuse of migrant labour would start to be eliminated straight away and that way we can protect the right to work at decent rate of pay for all workers in Britain. Changing the race to the bottom culture to a race for the job society. The final industrial problem I want to raise with you, and Tony mentioned it, is the issue of automation. 
In the hands of uncontrolled big business, the rapid development of automation is a threat to jobs and wages. But in the right hands, put to work for the benefits of society as a whole, robots and rob robotics could be the gateway to a better work-life balance and a more fulfilling society for millions of our people. Here, Unite once again has taken the lead, looking to safeguard the future of your jobs and communities, and indeed, the whole of our society. We have delivered advice for negotiators and discussion with shop stewards, the first union in Britain and Ireland to do so since 1979. And we have looked to develop a credible strategy, mapping out short and long-term industrial and political responses. The bottom line here, we can't trust the people who crashed the banks with controlling robots. Automation must be socially controlled and planned so its benefits can be reaped by society as a whole. Colleagues, there is one more issue, the most important of all, that I want to focus on before you go into your individual conferences. That key issue is growth, building a bigger union. Not at some point in the future, but at the present day top priority. For too long, we've had stagnant membership figures even drifting downwards in some areas. And we all know some of the reasons. When I talked about job losses before, I was, of course, talking about our members' jobs. Work disappearing in traditional union organised sectors and emerging instead in very difficult areas like the gig economy. But we must never reconcile ourselves to decline. If we do, we are kissing goodbye to all the things which can only be achieved by a bigger union. We've done a number of things already to address this problem. We've sustained the 100% campaign with its objective of making every worker a union member. Thousands of new members have come into our union every year as a result of this campaign. And data has proven that members who join through the 100% campaigns are more likely to stick with the union and help sustain our union's figures and fighting strength overall. And we've taken effective retention initiatives to stop members slipping away from the union unawares. We now need to build on those initiatives and go further too. I'll be meeting all of our full-time officers in January to spell out their responsibilities. We will be extending the targeted 100% strategy to the whole of every officer's allocation, every company, every workplace. So we will now have a plan for growth for the entire union, developing our broad industrial strategy uh, as we go along. We are also picking up greenfield organising once more. Our organising department made significant gains in extending trade unionism in new areas over many years. In recent times, they've been deployed on other priorities, including leverage. And whilst this will continue, they will now prioritise winning union recognition in what has hitherto been no-go areas. All this adds up to an ambitious plan. And I've told our regional secretaries that I'll be looking for a 5% net growth gain across the union in 2018. That's a challenge for them. It's a challenge for all of us. And I know one thing for sure. Without your involvement in, and engagement in growing Unite, it just won't happen. With a stronger, bigger union, we all benefit. And you too need to help develop ways to get Unite growing. In your workplaces, of course, in your regions, but also in your industrial sectors. Identifying targets, working out strategies to extend our membership in your own industries. 
Of course, this is a two-way street. Centrally, we're working on new ways to support all our reps and the vital work that you do. The year or two ahead of us will see the digital renewal of Unite. The key thing is finding out what you need and how can it be delivered more swiftly, efficiently and accessibly with the aid of new technology. Sisters and brothers, I've told you what we have achieved in Unite already. Just think what our union, just think what our union could be like with more members, 10, 20, 30% more. Our influence would grow from the workplace to Westminster, from grassroots to the boardrooms. That's not just desirable, it's vital. We know great changes are on their way in our countries. A progressive Labour Party is advancing and a weak, incompetent Tory government is disintegrating. People in Britain and Ireland are sick of rising inequality, cuts in public services and stagnant wages, while tax cheats go unpunished. They want a different society, an end to the situation where a decent, secure job and a place to live are unobtainable for millions, especially our young. But we know that those changes will never be achieved by governments alone. Society cannot be transformed solely from the top. Stronger trade unions are vital, not as an add-on to government, but as the very foundation of a more equal country. What we achieve in the workplace can do as much and a lot more to, in our countries than almost any decree from Whitehall. History teaches us that working people only prosper when trade unions are powerful. So let us go forward from today, determined to play our full part in changing Britain and Ireland for the better by building a larger, stronger unite, ready to put its full weight on the scales on the side of justice for the many and not the few. Thanks for listening, colleagues.